Section 14 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All About Coffee by William Eukers. Chapter 10 The Coffee Houses of Old London, Part 4. Some Famous Coffee Houses. Among the famous English coffee houses of the 17th 18th century period were St. James's, Will's, Garraway's, White's, Slaughter's, The Grecian, Buttons, Lloyd's, Tom's, and Don Saltero's. St. James's was a Whig house frequented by members of Parliament, with a fair sprinkling of literary stars. Garraways catered to the gentry of the period, many of whom naturally had Tory proclivities. One of the notable coffee houses of Queen Anne's reign was Buttons. Here, Addison could be found almost every afternoon and evening, along with Steele, Devenant, Carey, Phillips, and other kindred minds. Pope was a member of the same coffee house club for a year, but his inborn irascibility eventually led him to drop out of it. At Buttons, a lion's head, designed by Hogarth after the Lion of Venice, a proper emblem of knowledge and action being all head and paws, was set up to receive letters and papers for the Guardian. The Tatler and the Spectator were born in the coffee house, and probably English prose would never have received the impetus given it by the essays of Addison and Steele had it not been for coffee house associations. Pope's famous Rape of the Lock grew out of coffeehouse gossip. The poem itself contains one charming passage on coffee. Another frequenter of the coffee houses of London, when he had the money to do so, was Daniel Defoe, whose Robinson Crusoe was the precursor of the English novel. Henry Fielding, one of the greatest of all English novelists, loved the life of the more bohemian coffee houses and was, in fact, induced to write his first great novel, Joseph Andrews, through coffeehouse criticisms of Richardson's Pamela. Other frequenters of the coffee houses of the period were Thomas Gray and Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Garrick was often to be seen at Tom's in Birchin Lane, where also Chatterton might have been found on many an evening before his untimely death. The London Pleasure Gardens the second half of the 18th century was covered by the reigns of the Georges. The coffee houses were still an important factor in London life, but were influenced somewhat by the development of gardens in which were served tea, chocolate, and other drinks, as well as coffee. At the coffee houses themselves, while coffee remained the favorite beverage, the proprietors, in the hope of increasing their patronage, began to serve wine, ale, and other liquors. This seemed to have been the first step toward the decay of the coffee house. The coffee houses, however, continued to be the centers of intellectual life. When Samuel Johnson and David Garrick came together to London, literature was temporarily in a bad way, and the hack writers of the time dwelt in Grub Street. It was not until after Johnson had met with some success and had established the first of his coffee house clubs at the Turk's Head that literature again became a fashionable profession. This really famous literary club met at the Turk's Head from 1763 to 1783. Among the most notable members were Johnson, the arbiter of English prose, Oliver Goldsmith, Boswell, the biographer, Burke, the orator, Garrick, the actor, and Sir Joshua Reynolds, the painter. Among the latter members were Gibbon, the historian, and Adam Smith, the political economist. Certain it is that during the sway of the English coffee house, and at least partly through its influence, England produced a better prose literature, as embodied alike in her essays, literary criticisms, and novels, than she ever had produced before. The advent of the pleasure garden brought coffee out into the open in England, and one of the reasons why gardens, such as Renala and Vauxhall, began to be more frequented than the coffee houses was that they were popular resorts for women as well as for men. All kinds of beverages were served in them, and soon the women began to favor tea as an afternoon drink. 
At least the great development in the use of tea dates from this period, and many of these resorts called themselves tea gardens. The use of coffee by this time, however, was well established in the homes as a breakfast and dinner beverage, and such consumption more than made up for any loss sustained through the gradual decadence of the coffee house. Yet signs of the change in national taste that arrived with the Georges were not wanting, for the active propaganda of the British East India Company was fairly well launched during Queen Anne's reign. The London pleasure gardens of the 18th century were unique. At one time, there was a mighty maze of them. Their season extended from April or May to August or September. At first, there was no charge for admission, but Warwick Roth tells us that visitors usually purchased cheesecakes, syllabubs, tea, coffee, and ale. The four best-known London gardens were Vauxhall, Marleybone, Cooper's, where the charge for admission subsequently was fixed at not less than a shilling, and Ranella, where the charge of half a crown included the elegant regale of tea, coffee, and bread and butter. The pleasure gardens provided walks, rooms for dancing, skittle grounds, bowling greens, variety entertainments, and promenade concerts, and not a few places were given over to fashionable gambling and racing. The Vauxhall Gardens, one of the most favoured resorts of pleasure-seeking Londoners, were located in the Surrey side of the Thames, a short distance east of Vauxhall Bridge. They were originally known as the New Spring Gardens, 1661, to distinguish them from the Old Spring Gardens at Charing Cross. They became famous in the reign of Charles II. Vauxhall was celebrated for its walks, lit with thousands of lamps its musical and other performances, suppers, and fireworks. High and low were to be found there, and the drinking of tea and coffee in the arbors was a feature. The illustration shows the garden brightly illuminated by lanterns and lamps on some festival occasion. Coffee and tea were served in the arbors. The Ranella, a place of public entertainment, erected at Chelsea in 1742, was a kind of Vauxhall undercover. The principal room, known as the Rotunda, was circular in shape, 150 feet in diameter, and had an orchestra in the center and tiers of boxes all around. Promenading and taking refreshments in the boxes were the principal divertisements. Except on gala nights of masquerades and fireworks, only tea, coffee, bread, and butter were to be had at Ranala. In the group of gardens connected with mineral springs was the Dog and Duck, St. George's Spa, which became at last a tea garden and a dancing saloon of doubtful repute. Still another division, recognized by Roth, consisted mainly of tea gardens, among them Highbury Barn, the Cannonbury House, Hornsey and Copenhagen House, Bagnig Wells, and White Conduit House. The two last named were the classic tea gardens of the period. Both were provided with long rooms in case of rain and for indoor promenades with organ music. Then there were the Adam and Eve tea gardens with arbors for tea drinking parties, which subsequently became the Adam and Eve tavern and coffee house. Well known were the Bayswater tea gardens and the Jews harp house and tea gardens. All these were provided with neat genteel boxes led into the hedges and alcoves for tea and coffee drinkers. Locating the Notable Coffee Houses Garraway's, Three Change Alley, Cornhill, was a place for great mercantile transactions. Thomas Garway, the original proprietor, was a tobacconist and coffee man who claimed to be the first that sold tea in England, although not at this address. The latter, Garraway's, was long famous as a sandwich and drinking room for sherry, pale ale, and punch, in addition to tea and coffee. It is said that the sandwich maker was occupied two hours in cutting and arranging the sandwiches for the day's consumption. After the Great Fire of 1666, Garraway's moved into the same place in Exchange Alley where Elford had been before the fire. Here he claimed to have the oldest coffee house in London, but the ground on which Bowman's had stood was occupied later by the Virginia and the Jamaica coffee houses.
The latter was damaged by the fire of 1748, which consumed Garraways and Eldfords. Wills, the predecessor of Buttons, first had the title of the Red Cow, then of the Rose. It was kept by William Irwin and was on the north side of Russell Street at the corner of Bow Street. It was Dryden who made Will's Coffee House the great resort of the wits of his time, Pope and Spence. The room in which the poet was accustomed to sit was on the first floor, and his place was the place of honor by the fireside in the winter, and at the corner of the balcony looking over the street in fine weather. He called the two places his winter and his summer seat. This was called the dining room floor. The company did not sit in boxes as subsequently, but at various tables which were dispersed through the room. Smoking was permitted in the public room. It was then so much in vogue that it does not seem to have been considered a nuisance. Here, as in other similar places of meeting, the visitors divided themselves into parties, and we are told by Ward that the young beaux and wits, who seldom approached the principal table, thought it a great honor to have a pinch out of Dryden's snuff box. After Dryden's death, Wills was transferred to a house opposite and became Buttons over against Thomas's in Covent Garden. Thither also Addison transferred much company from Thomas's. Here Swift first saw Addison. Hither also came Steele, Arbuthnot, and many other wits of the time. Buttons continued in vogue until Addison's death and Steele's retirement into Wales, after which the coffee drinkers went to the Bedford, dinner parties to the Shakespeare. Buttons was subsequently known as the Caledonian. Slaughter's, famous as the resort of painters and sculptors in the 18th century, was situated at the upper end of the west side of St. Martin's Lane. Its first landlord was Thomas Slaughter, 1692. A second Slaughter's, New Slaughter's, was established in the same street in 1760, when the original Slaughter's adopted the name of Old Slaughter's. It was torn down in 1843 through 1844. Among the notables who frequented it were Hogarth, Young Gainsborough, Cipriani, Hayden, Rubiliac, Hudson, who painted the dilettante portraits, Mardell, the mezzotino scraper, Luke Sullivan, the engraver, Gardell, the portrait painter, and Perry, the Welsh harper. Toms, in Birchin Lane, Cornhill though in the main a mercantile resort, acquired some celebrity from having been frequented by Garrick. Tom's was also frequented by Chatterton, as a place of the best resort. Then there was Tom's in Devereux Court, Strand, and Tom's at 17 Great Russell Street, Covent Garden, opposite Buttons, a celebrated resort during the reign of Queen Anne and for more than a century after. The Grecian, Devereux Court, Strand, was originally kept by one Constantine, a Greek. From this house, Steele proposed to date his learned articles in the Tatler. It is mentioned in number one of the Spectator, and it was much frequented by Goldsmith. The Grecian was Foote's morning lounge. In 1843, the premises became the Grecian chambers with a bust of Lord Devereux, Earl of Essex, over the door. Lloyd's Royal Exchange celebrated for its priority of shipping intelligence and its marine insurance, originated with Edward Lloyd, who, about 1688, kept a coffee house in Tower Street, later in Lombard Street, corner of Abchurch Lane. It was a modest place for refreshment for seafarers and merchants. As a matter of convenience, Edward Lloyd prepared ship's lists for the guidance of the frequenters of the coffee house. These lists, which were written by hand, contained, according to Andrew Scott, an account of vessels which the underwriters who met there were likely to have offered them for insurance. Such was the beginning of two institutions that have since exercised a dominant influence on the sea-carrying trade of the whole world. The Royal Exchange Lloyds, the greatest insurance institution in the world, and Lloyds Register of Shipping. Lloyd's now has 1,400 agents in all parts of the world. It receives as many as 100,000 telegrams a year. It records through its intelligence service the daily movements of 11,000 vessels. In the beginning, one of the apartments in the exchange was fitted up as Lloyd's coffee room. Edward Lloyd died in 1712. Subsequently, the coffee house was in Pope's Head Alley, 
where it was called New Lloyd's Coffee House, but on September 14, 1784, it was removed to the northwest corner of the Royal Exchange, where it remained until the partial destruction of that building by fire. In rebuilding the exchange, there were provided the subscriber's or underwriter's room, the merchant's room, and the captain's room. The City, 2nd Edition, 1848, contains the following description of this most famous rendezvous of eminent merchants, shipowners, underwriters, insurance, stock, and exchange brokers. Here is obtained the earliest news of the arrival and sailing of vessels, losses at sea, captures, recaptures, engagements, and other shipping intelligence, and proprietors of ships and freights are insured by the underwriters. The rooms are in the Venetian style with Roman enrichments. At the entrance of the room are exhibited the shipping lists received from Lloyd's agents at home and abroad and affording particulars of departures or arrivals of vessels, wrecks, salvage, or sale of property saved, etc. To the right and left are Lloyd's books, two enormous ledgers. Right hand, ships spoken with or arrived at their destined ports. Left hand, records of wrecks, fires, or severe collisions, written in a fine Roman hand in double lines. To assist the underwriters in their calculations, at the end of the room is an anemometer, which registers the state of the wind day and night. Attached is a rain gauge. The British, Coxpur Street, long a house of call for Scotchmen, was fortunate in its landladies. In 1759, it was kept by the sister of Bishop Douglas, so well known for his works against Lauder and Bower, which may explain its Scottish fame. At another period, it was kept by Mrs. Anderson, described in Mackenzie's Life of Home as a woman of uncommon talents and the most agreeable conversation. Don Saltero's 18 Cheney Walk, Chelsea, was opened by a barber named Salter in 1695. Sir Hans Sloan contributed, of his own collection, some of the refuse gimcracks that were to be found in Salter's museum. Vice Admiral Munden, who had been long on the coast of Spain, where he had acquired a fondness for Spanish titles, named the keeper of the house Don Saltero, and his coffee house and museum Don Saltero's. Squires was in Fullwood's Rents, Holborn, running up to Gray's Inn. It was one of the receiving houses of the Spectator. In number 269, the Spectator accepts Sir Roger de Coverley's invitation to smoke a pipe with him over a dish of coffee at Squire's. As I love the old man, I take delight in complying with everything that is agreeable to him, and accordingly waited on him to the coffee house, where his venerable figure drew upon us the eyes of the whole room. He had no sooner seated himself at the upper end of the high table, but he called for a clean pipe, a paper of tobacco, a dish of coffee, a wax candle, and the supplement, a periodical paper of that time, with such an air of cheerfulness and good humor that all the boys in the coffee room, who seemed to take pleasure in serving him, were at once employed on his several errands, insomuch that nobody else could come at a dish of tea until the night had got all his conveniences about him. Such was the coffee room in the spectator's day. The Cocoa Tree was originally a coffee house on the south side of Pall Mall. When there grew up a need for places of resort of a more elegant and refined character, chocolate houses came into vogue, and the Cocoa Tree was the most famous of these. It was converted into a club in 1746. White's Chocolate House, established by Francis White about 1693 in St. James's Street, originally open to anyone as a coffee house, soon became a private club composed of the most fashionable exquisites of the town and court. In its coffee house days, the entrance was sixpence as compared with the average penny fee of the other coffee houses. Escott refers to White's as being the one specimen of the class to which it belongs, of a place at which, beneath almost the same roof and always bearing the same name, whether as coffee house or club, the same class of persons has congregated during more than 200 years. Among hundreds of other coffee houses that flourished during the 17th and 18th centuries, the following more notable ones are deserving of mention. 
Baker's, 58 Chain Jalley, for nearly half a century noted for its chops and steaks broiled in the coffee room and eaten hot from the gridiron. The Baltic, in Threadneedle Street, the rendezvous of brokers and merchants connected with the Russian trade. The Bedford, under the piazza in Covent Garden, crowded every night with men of parts and signalized for many years as the emporium of wit, the seat of criticism and the standard of taste. The Chapter, in Paternoster Row, frequented by Chatterton and Goldsmith. Childs, in St. Paul's Churchyard, one of the spectators' houses, and much frequented by the clergy and fellows of the Royal Society. Dix, in Fleet Street, frequented by Cowper, and the scene of Rousseau's Comedietta, entitled The Coffee House. St. James's, in St. James's Street, frequented by Swift, Goldsmith, and Garrick. Jerusalem and Cowper's Court, Cornhill, frequented by merchants and captains connected with the commerce of China, India, and Australia. Jonathan's in Chain Jalley, described by the Tatler as the general mart of stock jobbers. The London in Ludgate Hill, noted for its publishers' sales of stock and copyrights. Mann's in Scotland Yard, which took its name from the proprietor, Alexander Mann, and was sometimes known as Old Man's or The Royal, to distinguish it from Young Man's, Little Man's, New Man's, etc., minor establishments in the neighborhood. Nando's in Fleet Street, the favorite haunt of Lord Thurlow and many professional loungers, attracted by the fame of the punch and the charms of the landlady. New England and North and South American, in Threadneedle Street, having on its subscription list representatives of Bearings, Rothschilds, and other wealthy establishments. Peel's in Fleet Street, having a portrait of Dr. Johnson said to have been painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds, the Percy in Oxford Street, the inspiration for the Percy anecdotes. The Piazza in Covent Garden, where Macklin fitted up a large coffee room or theater for oratory, and Fielding and Foot poked fun at him. The Rainbow in Fleet Street, the second coffee house opened in London, having its token money. The Smyrna in Pall Mall, a place to talk politics and frequented by Pryor and Swift. Tom King's one of the old night houses of the Covent Garden Market, well known to all gentlemen to whom beds are unknown. The Turk's Head, Chain Jalley, which also had its tokens. The Turk's Head in The Strand, which was a favorite supping house for Dr. Johnson and Boswell. The Folly, a coffee house on a houseboat on the Thames, which became quite notorious during Queen Anne's reign. End of section 14.